Welcome to the Beltway Broadcast, the premier podcast for the workplace learning and talent development professionals of the Association for Talent Development's Metro DC chapter. We've got some great resources in store for you today. Hello, fellow ATDers. My name is Stephanie Hupka, and I am a chapter past president as well as a member of the pod squad here at the Metro DC chapter of ATD. Hi, everyone. I am Christina Eanes, the Vice President of Marketing and Communications. We also have Helena Hodges, our Vice President of Finance and Operations, as our producer. And for this episode, we are interviewing Beth McCormick. Welcome, Beth. Thank you so much. So happy to be here. We are absolutely thrilled that you are here. And in fact, I am really excited about our conversation today. I usually get ahead of myself. I'm not going to do it today. Before we get started, we would love it if you would tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, I've kind of had a funny journey to getting here. I think I, I say funny because it wasn't necessarily the intended path, but probably that's the same for everybody in their careers, I guess, at this point. Um, I actually started my career in sales and marketing, um, and and I actually did not start with a college degree. So I had started school, um, didn't last very long in it. Nobody in my family had gone to school previously, so it wasn't really a high value. I got into work in sales and marketing and then um, really kind of built a, a starter career in that. But I was feeling like, oh, I don't know if this is the right fit for me. I really enjoy people and I really enjoy learning about people and helping people. And so when I had my children, I was fortunate enough to be able to stay, take about five years to stay home with them. And during that time, I said, you know what? I'm going back to school. I need to finish what I started. And so I did. And I changed my the major that I had been on previously to sociology. I really wanted to learn about studying people and understanding people. And so um, fast forward those five years, I was in a situation, it was 2009, you know, it was a recession time, everybody had to get back to work. And so I said, I'm going to try a different path. And and I used some of my training background from uh, from my my sales training background to get into human resources and into learning and development and training and and into talent and really started to, to build a career from there. And so I got really interested in the learning and development side, particularly in leadership development. And so what I did was I started to work on an executive uh, coaching certificate through the University of Texas at Dallas. And while I was doing that, it was a year long um, intensive on executive and professional coaching. They really encourage you to find your niche. And as I was thinking about what my niche would be, I was just you know, like, wow, I really enjoy these professionals that I'm working with on a day-to-day basis and my everyday talent job. But at the same time, uh, my son was diagnosed with ADHD and dysgraphia. And so I really got interested in learning about those topics. And I recognized it was a very underserved area in terms of providing support to professionals who may have this diagnosis. And so it took me on this path to uh, begin coaching not only executives and professionals, but those specifically who identify as neurodiverse. And I found that people started to seek me out because they were working in the workplace. They wanted to be successful in the workplace and they wanted that opportunity to have some sort of support and think about what am I good at versus how do I minimize my weaknesses? And so this journey that started as a kind of sales and marketing career wound itself into training and development into talent and then gave me this opportunity to really explore this special very untapped area of serving those individuals who who are neurodivergent what a beautiful story first of all and I mean, what a wonderful segue into today's conversation, which is about neurodiversity. I have, I felt as if, the, especially in the last few years, neurodiversity has become such an important word. I'm seeing it in a lot of articles. I'm hearing a lot of professionals mention it. And a lot of that seems to have stemmed from conversations that started during the pandemic. And before we really dive into what we need to know about neurodiversity. I'd, I would love it if you would sort of define it for those of us who maybe are hearing it for the first time, maybe don't quite understand the breadth of what that term is used for in the workplace or even beyond. 
Yeah, absolutely. So neurodiversity comes from neurodivergent, which means simply different brain. Mm. So it means that there are some sort of cognitive differences. And there are a number of what we would say are diagnoses that fall under that umbrella of neuro, neurodiverse or neurodivergent. You might um, you know, know things such as autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, Tourette syndrome, obsessive compulsive disorder, a, a variety of learning differences, really anything that encompasses that, that difference in the way that we work through our cognitive function. And so we, we really nestle all of that um, under that umbrella term of neurodiverse or neurodivergent. Hmm. Yeah, that's a fantastic definition. Yeah. Well, and some of us, I guess, didn't even realize that we were neurodivergent <laughs> with our ADHD. <laughs> wow. This is, absolutely. this is already an eye opener yeah, for me. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yes. I no, just absolutely. had a moment. <laughs> I think we're all neurodivergent. I know. Huh? <laughs> yeah. So that actually is a good question on that. So do you know, like, is there like a percentage of the population that's neurodivergent or yeah. Is, is there anything in the long lines of like, um, if it's getting in your way or if it's not getting in your, like, I, I see my ADHD as like a superpower that I like to harness. So take us there. I love that. Mm. I love that for sure. So, so I can talk to you specifically about the workplace, mm -hmm. about 12 and a half percent of Americans in the workplace would be considered neurodiverse. And about half of those individuals actually realize that they're neuro neurodiverse or have a <laughs> diagnosis or really understand that. Um, and so, yes, there, you know, I think about this really generationally. What I see is that um, individuals who are fall in, let's say, gener Gen X and maybe a little bit older were not familiar with those terms and may have received their diagnosis later in life. Yep. <laughs> and so, what happened? Yeah. So, so what happens in that case is they probably have a lot of things they have to undo from their childhood. Mm -hmm. So, an interesting thing that happened when my son was diagnosed with ADHD and dysgraphia, my husband was also diagnosed with ADHD, and he uh, it was a huge awakening for him because he went through his childhood believing that he was a poor student, mm -hmm. a poor speller, that he got into trouble. Um, and it really, you know, obviously impacted his, his self, um, you know, identification of who he was and how he moved through the world. And it took him a long time as an adult and a professional to really work through all of those things. And so that's something that I definitely see in my client base for individuals, you know, I'd even say maybe older millennials and, and older who didn't have that diagnosis early in life, didn't receive any sort of accommodations and also have a lot of shame associated with however they were meant to, to feel uh, as children when they didn't have those, those special programs in schools to be able to help them or set them up for success, when they were put in a position where they had to use you know, traditional uh, learning and, and teaching styles to be in the school and learn. And maybe we're seen as daydreamers or maybe we're seen as disorganized Hyper. or, you know, got into trouble, all of those things. <laughs> and so there's it, it does take a bit to separate that. Right. To recognize like, oh, wait a minute, there wasn't anything wrong with me. I had a cognitive difference than others, but people didn't know because maybe it just wasn't readily apparent. Mm -hmm. Right. That we it's called an invisible disability because you can't necessarily see it within individuals, um, you know, who are. Uh, you know, walking through through their everyday life and maybe have just a little bit of something that works differently in their brain, you know, in their executive function. Um, now, I will say that as we think about the younger generation, so as we think about Gen Z, as we think about um, the upcoming Gen Alpha, these are individuals who are um, in, in an environment where it is more readily accepted and more reasonably diagnosed mm -hmm and they get interventions much younger. So my mm. son started getting in interventions in second grade mm -hmm. versus my husband who was in, well into his 40s when he found out you know, that, that he had this yeah. very clear diagnosis, just wasn't exposed to it before. And so that's kind of the interesting situation we're in here now professionally is we have essentially, I, I think about it kind of in two different buckets, right? The, the people that got the diagnosis maybe a little later in life, who have been just coping and building their own coping skills through time. And then the individuals who are like, hey, 
I've been getting accommodations and I expect accommodations. And this is, you know, I'm coming into the workplace or coming into the university and all of these things have been put in place to build my success in school. I would like that in the workplace as well. I think that's a really interesting question to dig into because, you know, especially as you were talking about how many of the older millennials and even older than that may not have access to resources, they may not have official diagnoses, there may be a lot at play. Perhaps they don't necessarily know themselves that they might be neurodiverse or they've not thought of themselves in that way. When you're thinking about the workplace, whether it is incorporating people into a team and making space, perhaps it's even when you're thinking about designing and delivering training, which is something so many of us do, and you're thinking about learners who might be in front of you, what are some of the considerations we should keep in mind while we are making sure that we are as inclusive of people as we possibly can be? That's a great question. Um, so my the issue that I wrote for TD at Work uh, really focused on this, what I proposed is a three-prong approach. Mm. And it's important to recognize and understand that not everyone feels comfortable disclosing their diagnosis. They, yeah. you know, they may work very hard to suppress it. Um, some people are really comfortable, like you, Christina, very, you know, like I this is my superpower yes. and I can do amazing <laughs> things with it. Um, and so what I would challenge uh, organizations to do is to um, act as if y you have 12% of your 12 and a half percent of your population is neurodivergent and create some some opportunities there. So the three prong approach is um, is to support. It is to individualize development and it is to accommodate. So I'll mm. kind of, I'll take those backwards. I'll start with accommodate. That's what I addressed first in, in this particular article. There are a number of things that you can do that are great accommodations for anyone in the workplace, whether or not they're neurodivergent, whether it is incorporating, um, you know, different types of, uh, of environments. If you're in, a, in an actual office where people can have control of their lighting or the mm -hmm. sense that they have or the space that they take up, um, you know, do they have access to different types of technology that may be more comfortable to them, whether it is, um, you know, like my son, for instance, with his dysgraphia, he gets speech to text technology. Mm. So he's dysgraphia is a writing disability. Mm. And so he has a hard time processing his thoughts from his brain to come out literally through his hand. Mm. And so he can type everything, he can speak it and it'll type it. So these are the different types. There's so many different um, accommodations that are available or, or within um, you know, the different areas of neurodivergence. And so if as an organization, you're willing to invest in a few things, you may be able to really accommodate a large group of people, whether they identify as neurodiverse or not. These are, these are great things. You know, one of the example I gave in, in this publication was my son uh, getting a wobbly stool as an accommodation for him because he, he couldn't sit still in the classroom. <laughs> So they gave them, they, they bought some wobbly stools. Mm -hmm. It's an actual thing that they put in oh, elementary schools, awesome. if, you know, for these kids. Yeah. And, and it immediately started changing um, his ability to engage, be still, listen, all of those things. And so they started to kind of play around with letting some of the other kids use these wobble stools. And they actually found that even the kids who didn't have a diagnosis or were receiving accommodations or formalized accommodations benefited from being oh, able yeah. to move in their seed and, you know, and, and be a little bit different. So the, the PTA at the school ended up buying a whole bunch of wobbly wow. stools so that all of the kids could have access to these things. And, and to me, that's the way we want to think about it when it comes to accommodations. There's so many cost-effective ways to do that. Um, askjan.org, A-S-K-J-A-N.org, that's the Job Accommodation Network, Ooh. is a great website with a ton, ton, ton of resources for looking at how to accommodate. The next is the individualized um, development. So really, I, I like the idea, and this is kind of what I've posed, in school, when you have accommodations or you've gone, gone through the formal process for um, for any sort of uh, you know neurodivergence, whether it's autism spectrum disorder, whether it's ADHD, as I've talked about quite a bit, or any of the others, um, there is a formalized plan called the Individualized Education Program. There, there, that's one. The other one is the 504 plan. 
And so these are the, the things that you, the parents meet with the students and the teachers and, and administration. They talk through what accommodations do these children need to be successful in the classroom? And that's revisited on a yearly basis through various diagnostics, so on and so forth. This is what the children who are going to come into the workplace in Gen Alpha and already are in Gen Z, this is what they're used to. So I'm thinking through, through this process, what a great way to pair something like that with what we know in our industry as the IDP, the Individual Development mm. Plan, where you are looking at career goals, you're looking at the different uh, opportunities, you're writing those SMART goals, and you're taking into account the opportunity to provide the various accommodations or special needs that an individual might have based on where they, where, where they are. Um, and they get to be a part of that. They get to help identify. And then the organization gets to support and, and find ways to be a partner with them. And then that last piece is support. So, um, you know, it's so critical to have access to things like, um, you know, a, um, an employee assistance program where there's access to counselors who specialize, for instance, in supporting individuals with autism spectrum disorder or supporting individuals with obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, you know, anything that you can think of in terms of benefits, whether it's a, a great wellness plan, whether it's a, a really great sleep and diet plan, working with a sleep coach, mm -hmm. working with, there are so many different things that you can do as an organization, even through the benefits that you probably already possess that can be tailored to supporting individuals who have this neurodiver neurodivergent diagnosis. So, so those are kind of the, the big three areas, the accommodate, the you know, individualize that development, and then provide that support are the top recommendations for organizations. And then you, it doesn't matter if you are in there identifying and checking off who is neurodivergent or who isn't, you don't need to know that information. You probably aren't always going to know that information. Yeah. Oh, I love I'd that. I'd actually love to back up to something that you shared just a moment ago, Beth, and actually toward the beginning of what you were sharing about some of the accommodations. I'd read an article that noted that through the pandemic, we actually unlocked an accommodation that many people who are neuro neurodivergent may not necessarily have known they needed, and that was the ability to work from home. Mm. And especially with those meetings, you know, the, the Zoom meetings and Teams meetings and things like that. And one of the reasons, this surprised me a bit, and I throw this out there because I think it's important for us to all consider, is that when you are on a, you know, some sort of a, a meeting, you have a couple of options. And that includes doing, doing things like turning off your camera. Mm -hmm. If you feel as though that's going to be distracting or you feel as though that's going to take away from your ability to participate fully, something that a lot of us had not necessarily thought about, where for some people it can be very draining to feel as though everyone's looking at them. When they have a little bit of a chance to shield themselves from that, a lot of times that's where people are able to shine. And it was something many organizations did not see before the pandemic, but are now recognizing. And it's really enabling everyone to be able to participate in a way that feels natural mm -hmm. and successful for them. Um, so it's really interesting to hear you mention that. And I, I have one more question too. And Chris, you made me think about yes. it. Because you mentioned that for you, you have a superpower mm -hmm. in ADHD. <laughs> and it got me thinking that for a lot of people, they may not necessarily think about being, being neurodiverse as you know, being a, having a superpower mm -hmm. and being able to use that. For those of us who either are neuro neurodiverse or who may work with people who are, what does it look like to help people to unleash that superpower? Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes you find people with these incredible skill sets that may not be identified or possibly are, but are underutilized. Have you experienced that or seen that? Or do you have any tips on how we can help to bring out the best in each other? Mm. No, thank you so much for asking that. I think it's really important to recognize where some of the uh, the thought leadership started in this area with, with regards to neurodiversity in the workplace. There is an individual named Thorkil Son who started an organization called Specialist Stern that was a software testing firm. And what he recognized through his own son who had been, uh, he had been diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, mm -hmm. his son had this incredible uh, ability to detect patterns yeah. like that no one else could possibly see. As he would look at different data sets and information, he could just see these patterns emerge. And so uh, Mr. Son then said, hey, look, what if I hired all people who are on the autism spectrum disorder 
uh, or autism disorder and, and determine like, what are they able to find in terms of patterns? And they found that it was a really um, effective way to do business for them. These were leveraging the superpowers of individuals on the spectrum. And what we know is that through, through the research that we've seen, approximately 50% of American adults on the autism spectrum uh, are underemployed mm. or have not had the ability to find work that, that suits them or that is um, you know, capable of, of recognizing what the, what the strengths are and how to leverage that. Similarly, individuals with ADHD are 18 times more likely to be disciplined at work for be behavioral issues and 60% more likely to lose their job for things wow. like disorganization and planning issues, so on and so forth. And so it's our responsibility to think about how can we continue to educate individuals within our organizations to recognize these superpowers? Because I will tell you, I have the coolest clients on the planet. They are so smart and have the best ideas and really what we work on is, you know, hey, if you're really great at innovation and creation and entrepreneurship, then let's find the people in your, in your realm that will handle the details, that will handle the execution, the areas that may not be those strengths. We'll just, we'll find a tools in the toolkit to make that happen. And once we're able to quiet that noise and remove those obstacles, it really is a beautiful thing to watch someone re really shine in where they are. You know, if we think about people on the autism spectrum disorder who, um, you know, have the skill set like we talked about with Specialist Stern, um, you know, th there is a lot of great opportunities. Um, you know, they tend to prefer repetitive work that others might find boring. They, they prefer to have a, a place where they know what to expect and, and have that, that environment exactly as they uh, expect it and can do those tasks repetitively and day to day. And that's awesome. We, we want to create those opportunities for these individuals because those superpowers are, are really what help us be effective in our businesses and, and not have to worry about these what you know, they feel are unsavory um, components to having a different mind. Yeah. Okay. One last question before we get to rapid fire, because we looked at uh, the creating that environment, right, for neurodivergent. Um, but what about for any suggestions for the individual uh, in the environment? Let's say you're not feeling like you're in a supportive environment. Like I was very lucky to uh, turn into entrepreneurship. So my super hyper productivity levels weren't annoying to my colleagues because it's all me. And <laughs> right? so it, it would be just, a, it would be nice to hear advice on it. how could a neurodivergent individual maybe um, advocate for themselves in maybe without necessarily sharing or sharing their status? Any suggestions? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, for sure. So my first recommendation would be get a coach, mm -hmm. get an executive function coach or get a coach that specializes in working with neurodivergent individuals. There are, there are so many out there, myself included. Um, it is a very sensitive topic mm. and it is very personal yeah. and, and there are a lot of, you know, feelings associated with that as well. Like, you know, I, I ask some of my clients who, um, you know, struggle with maybe childhood elements of, of their neurodiverse status. I request that they also work with a therapist mm. in addition to me. I'm not, you know, I'm yeah. not a therapist, I'm a coach. Um, but you know, that's something. When it comes to the workplace, it is important to know and understand, um, at least within the United States, I, I have to you know, do considerable more research to talk about other countries, um, but these, these diagnoses that fall under this umbrella are protected by the Americans with Disabilities Act. Mm. And so you are protected within your workplace to request accommodations to help you be successful in work. And so I would recommend, you know, partnering with your human resources department, talking to them, talking to somebody in a role, maybe it's an HR business partner or you know, someone with, within that space or someone from benefits, somebody that you trust and are comfortable with to say, hey, you know, I need some advice. What, what do we have available with within the organization that we can work on? Or you know, maybe you have a leader that you really trust or somebody that maybe isn't your leader, but somebody else in the organization that you really trust that you can come to and talk 
to talk about this. It's also possible to request accommodations without having to disclose what your diagnosis mm. is. You just need to be really clear about what you're asking. Yeah. And I'll say that's, that is a lot what I work with, um, with my own clients on is identifying what to ask for. Mm. And a lot of my clients don't disclose, mm. um, you know, so let's, okay, let's talk through what specifically are you struggling with? And then let's talk about how to ask mm. for it. I love it. Oh, and I wish we could talk more about this, but well, we still will get some more information oh, out of you. Too. So at the end of every episode, <laughs> we do rapid fire questions. They only take about 60 seconds to respond. Are you ready? I'm yes. ready. Come on. Where's that? Yes. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I know the buildup is like, yeah, and then it's like really simple questions. Anyway. <laughs> so <laughs> what is one book that you would recommend to others and why? Oh, yes. Um, well, first I would say the monster at the end of this book, because it is the most precious book about Grover and it's Thank an important you. book. But yes. <laughs> my real, my real answer is I would love it if everyone would read The Power of Neurodiversity, mm. which is by Dr. Thomas Armstrong. Mm. This is a, a book that is chock filled with information about the various diagnoses and all of the, the strengths related to each of them. Um, and if you are just new to understanding this term, I would highly recommend that you take a look at that book. It's great information. Oh, I love it. Okay. Next one. What is a tool and you can define tool, however you would like a tool that you cannot live without. The tool I cannot live without is my cozy calendar app. <laughs> so this is a, a, a calendar app that I use for my family. I've used it for years. And it is the only way that I can possibly stay organized between my two mm -hmm. teenagers and their activities. We have five pets in our house wow. and it interfaces with my, with my, uh, you know, professional outlook calendar. So I couldn't live without it. And it houses my grocery list. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's a multi, Unbelievable. multi tools there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What is the best piece of advice you've ever been given? The best piece of advice I was ever given was a big wake up call for me. It actually has to do with being a woman in the workplace. Mm. I was asked for my uh, subject matter opinion to be given to two male executives in the organization for which I was working. And I gave a very uh, well thought out answer with a recommendation. And the last thing I said was for what it's worth. Ooh. And my, I had copied my boss on it, who was a, a woman. And she immediately called me and said, do not ever say that. Everything you say has worth, you, you know, and, and I realized I had some em embedded behaviors, much like, you know, neurodiverse individuals may have some embedded behaviors in their thoughts about themselves. I had some embedded behaviors about being a woman in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And so I've always been since then very, been very conscientious about recognizing that the work that I do is, is worthwhile for sharing. And that's why I was asked for my, Aww. my, you know, thoughts on it. That is so powerful. Yes. What a wonderful way to wrap up. Although I have to say, like, like I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, I was so excited about this topic and you have given me so much more than I expected in this very quick 30 minutes. So First of all, thank you so much for all of the insights and the ideas. Thank you also for mentioning Monster at the end of this book. I I mean, I cannot tell you how much that made me smile. That was like, that's one of the best call-outs we've had on the show. So thank you so much for being here today. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It was truly my, my pleasure. And thank you for giving this topic, this very, very important topic, a platform. We are very happy to continue this conversation and ensure that all of our listeners have access to it. Like you said, it's, it's really essential at this point in the workplace. And of course, many thanks to all of you in our community for listening, but don't tune out yet. Before you go, we have a message from our producer, Helena Hodges. Attend one of our upcoming programs. There are many to choose from. Simply go to dcatd.org and select chapter calendar to find out more. Would you like to be even more involved in our wonderful community? Go to dcatd.org and click on volunteer to get started. Mm -hmm.